Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Skylar Thompson, and I lead the advocacy work at the nonprofit human rights activists in Iran. We've been following this issue very closely over the past weeks, and so I'm very honored to be here to moderate the discussion today. I want to thank you for joining this side event in the margins of the 51st session of the Human Rights Council. We're going to discuss an urgent matter of the ongoing violent crackdown of women and protesters in Iran. I just want to flag for everyone that this event is being recorded. It's co-sponsored by the coalition Impact Iran, a number of international and regional human rights organizations, and by the permanent mission of Germany to the United Nations. This discussion is happening as we observe the 19th day of nationwide protests in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Protests that began after the brutal death and detention of Masa Jina Amini, a 22 year old girl who was arrested for allegedly not wearing a proper hijab and who ultimately lost her life because of it. Masa, like other women and girls in the Islamic Republic was treated as a second class citizen, a challenge women in Iran have faced for over 40 years. The recent largely peaceful protests have been met with excessive use of force, including the lethal use of force and the widespread use of arbitrary arrests. There's also been a widespread disruption of internet, including complete internet shutdowns and the disruption of telecommunication platforms such as WhatsApp and Instagram. Today, we will have the opportunity for panelists to offer updates on the unfolding situation, share their insights and analysis and formulate recommendations. To do this, I'm honored to have a number of incredibly distinguished panelists and experts in the field, and I'll have the pleasure to introduce them all momentarily. But first, I'm honored to introduce Ms. Louise Amsberg, Federal Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance at the German Federal Foreign Office to provide introductory remarks. Ms. Amsberg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, and partners. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, side event on human rights in Iran on the margins of the 51st session of the Human Rights Council. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who has contributed to making this important event possible over the last few days on, and at a very short notice. Um, we are all here today, physically or virtually, um, because we are united by our deep concern about the human rights situation in Iran and in our solidarity with the women of Iran and all, all other Iranians claiming their fundamental human rights by bravely taking to the streets. We are united in our deep sorrow about the violent and futile death of Gina Massa Amini, Women's rights have been and are constantly violated in Iran. Women whose civil and political, social and economic and also reproductive rights are controlled, defined and also limited by others. Iranian women who have endured repression on a massive scale for decades are now risking their lives in order to demonstrate their fundamental rights. We are united in our solidarity with young Iranians inside and outside of their country. They are the future of Iran. We stand by their side in words and in our actions. The violent death Gina Massa, of Gina Massa Amini in the custody of the Iranian so-called morality police and subsequent protests have opened the world's eyes to the structural human rights violations Iranians face in their country. The primary victims are, as it is so often the case, women. Over the past um, weeks, Iranians have bravely raised their voices against the violation of their freedom of expression, freedom of the press and freedom of assembly, against the death penalty and extrajudicial executions, against torture and forced disappearances and systematic impunity. With great bravery, people from Baluchistan to West Azerbaijan are taking to the streets. The international community must speak out clearly and unambiguously to condemn the violence against demonstrators by the Iranian security forces. Political and civil rights are not something that has been imposed upon Iran from the outside. They are universal. Iran as a signatory to the ICCPR has a responsibility to put them into practice. When governments fear their people, they silence them offline and online. And I call on the Iranian authorities to stop this ruthless violence. Our feminist foreign policy means that we stand in solidarity with the women in Iran and that we call on the Iranian authorities to respect human rights and in particular, women's rights. 
And I would like to cite our foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, who said, unless women are safe, no one is safe. Women are the backbone of our societies. So no society can function properly without the work and the engagement of women. We rely on women economically, socially, and politically, be it in terms of earning money for directly supporting family members, nutrition and care of our children, as well as elderly, fighting for social justice or running for office. Alongside our partners, Germany will continue to address this bilaterally and at multilateral level. At the EU level, we are working on measures against those responsible for the violent crackdowns. Last week, we joined 50 other states in supporting a cross-regional statement here at the UN Human Rights Council condemning the flagrant violation of women's rights and calling on Iran to uphold the right to the freedom of expression and assembly. We will also raise this issue at the negotiations in the third committee of the UN General Assembly. We will continue to strongly support the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran and the work of the mandate holder. I call on Iran to finally grant him access to the country. And I welcome the expressions of solidarity with women in Iran, in Germany and around the globe. This solidarity is important if we want to remind them that they are not alone. In the midst of all this, we must also recognize that the international community faces enormous challenges in light of the many crises in the world. We must not allow ourselves to be divided into countries that respect and defend international law and those countries that ride roughshod over international agreements. If we are to achieve this unity, we must be honest and also self-critical. And more importantly, we must not lose sight of any of the individual human rights crises around the world, be it the global food crisis intensified by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, or the women of Afghanistan who took the streets in protest after the attack on women and girls a few days ago. They all require our commitment and they all are deserving of our solidarity. And I would like to thank you all for attending this important site event today for us to reflect on what further can be done to strengthen human rights in Iran. We stand united in solidarity with Iranians. You are not alone. We see you and we hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Amsberg. I certainly echo your calls, this very powerful introduction. Um, moving forward with the discussion for today, We'll start with a series of brief interventions from our panelists, um, but we'll keep some time at the end for a Q&A with you in the audience. Um, you're welcome to answer Q&A in the chat box throughout the conversation today. To begin the conversation, I'm delighted to give the floor to Dr. Javid Rehman, UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Iran. Dr. Rehman has been monitoring and reporting on the situation of human rights in Iran since 2018. Uh, Dr. Rehman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this invitation for me to speak on the violent crackdown on women and protesters in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Allow me firstly to express my deep and sincere condolences and sympathies to the family of Masa Amini and other victims of the ongoing state repression and state killings. I have strongly condemned Masa Amini's death in police custody after her arrest for allegedly failing to dress by wearing an improper hijab. While the Iranian authorities have characteristically denied responsibility for the death of Ms. Amini, all, all available evidence, including the testimony by the family of Ms. Amini, in particular her father's statements, photos of Ms. Amini, from the intensive care unit, as well as the reported comments from medical sources point to state culpability, violence, and brutality. Here, I would also like to reiterate the observations made by the Human Rights Committee in its general comment number 36, where the committee notes, and I'm quoting from the general comment, the committee says that loss of life occurring in custody in unnatural circumstances creates a presumption of arbitrary deprivation of life by state authorities, which can only be re rebutted on the basis of a proper investigation. 
I therefore call upon the Iranian authorities to hold an independent, impartial, and prompt investigation into Ms. Amini's death, uh, make the findings of the investigation public, and hold, hold all perpetrators accountable. The use of physical violence to enforce the hijab to which Ms. Amini was subjected is unmental human rights and human dignity faced by girls and women in Iran. As we witness, and at the orders of the Iranian state, there has been increased repression of women who peacefully protest compulsory hijab laws. The government has intensified social restrictions and has, um, has, in these, has expanded street patrols, subjecting women perceived to be wearing what we can call loose hijab to verbal and physical harassment and arrests and shutting down several businesses for lack of strict enforcement of hijab rules. In July 2022, President Ibrahim Raisi himself called on government entities to strictly implement a, a chastity and hijab law, calling the lack of compliance with hijab rules an organized promotion of moral corruption in Islamic society. The head of judiciary also called on against those advocating against mandatory wearing of the hijab. Masa Amini's death has provoked considerable political unrest and is shaping large-scale national protests and demonstrations. The authorities' response, as in previous occasions, particularly as seen during the November 2019 protests, has been to resort to use of arbitrary, excessive, lethal force against protesters, placing serious restrictions on internet services and social media across the country, rounding up, arresting, or torturing human rights activists, lawyers, and journalists. The official political rhetoric has, ma has matched the forceful and brutal crackdown against those who are protesting. On 25th of September, the head of the judiciary emphasized leniency against the core instigators of the riots. And the president also stated that the country, again, I quote him, would decisively be. On 23rd September, the Iranian army issued a statement warning that it will confront the enemies, various plots in order to ensure security. On 22nd September, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps issued a statement condemning ongoing protests in Iran and as a product of an enemy conspiracy and described the protesters as protests as sedition and called on the judiciary to prosecute those who, who, in their view, were spreading fake news. On 26th of September, Tasneem News website affiliated with the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps announced that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps' position of terrorist groups in Iraq's Kurdistan region. Iranian laws, state practices, and societal approaches perpetuate violence against women in men upon the Iranian authorities to immediately end violence against women, including ending violence through the law of enforced hijab. I also ask for for the Iranian authorities to repeal all laws that mitigate or exonerate perpetrators of violence against women and girls, including for the so-called honor killings and criminal acts within marriage and ensure accountability of these perpetrators. I ask the authorities to immediately implement measures to end child marriages and discrimination against women and girls within all aspects of family laws ratify the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women without reservations and to ensure that legislation and policies are consistent with its obligations. On the issues relating to use of force against protesters, I ask the authorities to immediately stop the use of unlawful, arbitrary, excessive lethal force and, and all forms of violence, arrests and detentions of the protesters. It is obligatory upon the Iranian authorities to ensure 
that their laws, policies, and practices are fully in compliance with international standards and that all perpetrators of state instigated violence and human rights violations must be held fully accountable. State authorities, its agents and officials must be held accountable for the ongoing grave violations of human rights in this current wave of protests, as well as for the November 2019 and other protests that took place during 2021 and 2022. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Next, I'm honored to introduce Mr. Clement Nayala tassi UN Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Association and Peaceful Assembly. Mr. Voulet, on the 22nd of September, yourself, along with Dr. Raymond and a number of experts, denounced the violence directed against peaceful protesters and human rights defenders in an official communication. I give you the floor to further, further elaborate your reactions to these protests and crackdowns. Good morning. Good afternoon, distinguished delegates and participants from diplomatic missions, human rights defenders, NGO, and media. Thank you, Scott Thompson, for the introduction and to all the organizers for the invitation I sent to me to join this important event to discuss the deeply concerning situation in Iran. I'm honored to join this panel of experts together with my colleague, Javed Rena, and others to elaborate and to find a way to ensure that the ongoing killing and repression can be put to end. Let me start first by praying, by paying a tribute to the bravery of civil society, human rights defenders and protesters, especially to the women and girls who stand up for their rights and defy oppression in Iran, despite the risk to their lives. As the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association, I stand in full solidarity with you. I would like to assure you that I'm monitoring closely the situation in Iran with my colleague Javed, and we continue to call on the Iran Authority to respect and protect the rights of Iranians to exercise their freedom of peaceful assembly. I have been closely monitoring the recent and very concerning situation that have erupted after the death in custody of 22 years old Masha Amini, who was arrested on 13 September for allegedly not wearing a hijab in full compliance with Iranian mandatory requirement for how women must dress. Thousands of people have joined anti-government demonstration throughout the country over the past days to demand accountability for this death. Instead of listening to the protester demands and hold accountable those responsible for Masha death, the Iranian authority chose the repression than this escalation of the tension, causing around 133 deaths, including women and children, and 100 injured across, or across at least 17 provinces, according to several reports. I reiterate my call to the Iranian authority to stop violent crackdown on national wide protests in an attempt to suppress the protests and silence their call for accountability and respect of women. I'm deeply concerned that many Iranians have been killed, injured, and detained during the protests, including women and children. There seems to be a pattern of Iranian security forces deliberately and unlawfully using lethal force against protesters, such as a fire, firing live ammunition, metal pellets, and bird shots at protesters and bystanders. Under the international law, the killing resulting from such unlawful use of firearms are considered deliberate killing and constitute extrajudicial execution. As I have stated many times, firearms must never be used to police assembly or to disperse an assembly. According to the international human rights law and, and standard, force in the context of assembly could only be used when it is strictly necessary. Lethal force can only be used in case of an imminent threat to the life or serious injury, and only when less extreme means are insufficient to achieve the legitimate law enforcement objective. I would like to recall the joint report issued by my mandate and the special rapporteur on extrajudicial killing and killing on the proper management of assembly. Also, the Iranian authority must ensure that the law law enforcement in their response to the protests 
comply with the basic principle of on the use of force and firearm by law, official, law enforcement official. Furthermore, I have been informed about a widespread pattern of torture and other ill treatment, including repeatedly and severe beating of protesters and bystanders as a tactic to punish protesters, disperse crowd, and prevent people filming the response of law enforcement. I'm also deeply concerned about reports of sexual assault and other forms of gender-based and sexual violence against women protesters, including grabbing women's breasts and violently pulling women from their hair in reprisal for removing their headscarves. This is unacceptable and constitutes torture. As I reiterate in my latest report to the Human Rights Council on protests in crisis situation, state must ensure that any response to assembly does not infringe, among other, the right to life, the right to be free from torture or queer inhuman or degrading, degrading treatment or punishment, the right to not be convicted or sentenced to heavier penalty by virtue of retroactive criminal legislation, the right to, re to, recognition, to recognition of everyone as a person before the law, the right to be free from arbitrary deprivation of liberty, as these rights are not derogable in all circumstances, including in a state of emergency. I'm calling on the Iranian authority to immediately stop the excessive use of lethal force while policing protests and to comply with the fundamental principle of legality, proportion, necessity, non-discrimination, and proportionality. I want also to emphasize that, that I received the report of the internet shutdown during the during this particular time, when internet and information should be flow from Iran in order to help the international community to be aware of what is happening. Blank internet shutdown violate the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, association, and expression. And as I stated in my report, a such conduct to shut down internet in, in a time of protest and in a time where information should be flow is a clear violation of human, human rights. Finally, I'm concerned about the persistent impunity with respect to the crime under international law and other serious human rights violations committed in Iran in the context of assembly. To justify the killing of protesters, the Iranian authority have stigmatized protesters, accusing them of, be of being people from the west and northwest of Iran where anti-revolutionary groups are active or alleging of being killed by private individuals to provoke public opinion and to keep the protest active. The lack of accountability in Iran for violation in the context of peaceful protest is persistent. And my colleague Javed just gave a number of uh, protests that's happening in the past, where we also raise our concern about the killing. And until now, nothing was done, no accountability, no police or official was prosecuted. State is obliged under the international law to investigate and to ensure that Killing happening during the context of peaceful protests are prosecuted, and that those who are responsible are punished. Given the lack of willingness of the Iranian authority to prosecute and to investigate what happened this time, and ensure that those who are currently conducting unlawful killing during this protest are prosecuted, I'm calling the Human Rights Council to reinforce his monitoring mechanism and accountability on Iran. This accountability can look such as setting in place a new mechanism that can investigate what is going on currently in Iran. It is important to stop this kind of killing and also to stop the cycle of impunity that we are witnessing in Iran. I thank you very much. Thank you for that really powerful intervention, Mr. Voulet. Uh, I now turn to Ms. Azadeh Porzan, Human Rights Officer at Impact Iran and Women Rights Researcher. Ms. Porzan has researched and published about women rights movements in Iran for several years. I give you the floor, Azadeh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm so grateful that we have a panel and an opportunity to discuss the situation with such distinguished experts, um, and independent UN experts in particular in the panel. Um, I just would like to take the time to very briefly um, highlight some of the points that 
uh, stand out to us um, in the human rights civil society community um, uh, of NGOs and organizations that work and focus on Iran throughout the years. Um, some context was given, so I'm not going to waste um, your time going over them again. Uh, but in continuation of what was said, I would like to highlight that in the in the community where we work um, on the human rights situation in Iran, I have to say that we were not one bit surprised by the level of crackdown and the pattern of crackdown that the Islamic Republic has used against the protesters and others um, in the country. We are deeply familiar by now uh, with uh, the way the Islamic Republic uh, uses uh, lethal force, um, a, a, a violent approach against protesters, and sometimes uh, those who are only watching the protest, um, the massive um, uh, rounds of uh, detentions of protesters, but also those who are um, um, sometimes a lot of the times are being arrested from home um, and uh, uh, you know their lack uh, of access to fair trial uh, but, um, you know uh, maltreatment and torture and uh, internet shutdown and so on unfortunately unfortunately all of that was predictable to those of us who follow iran closely for years um, and um, I would also like to um, highlight the interconnectivity of rights um, at play in, in uh, today's Iran, as um, uh, the two special rapporteurs also pointed out. Uh, uh, you know, we see in Iran uh, the violation of uh, a myriad of rights, um, including, as uh, as was pointed out, uh, a situation of uh, you know. Of, women's rights, rule of law, the rights to association and assembly, and so on. There's, they're really um, uh, very, all of them in, interconnected. And uh, in a way, it's, uh, it's also kind of symbolic of what is happening in Iran, which is uh, as evident in the slogans, uh, the demands uh, on the streets of the protesters are not uh, uh, exclusively about women's rights, because uh, as a, a panelist mentioned, uh, Iranians have reached a point that they see women's rights and their own um, uh, collective dignity so intertwined at this point because of the layered uh, 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 discrimin uh, discrimination, discriminatory approach and, and uh, various forms of repression that the Islamic Republic has used over the years that uh, these two are, uh, I mean, women's rights with all the other rights in the country are now uh, very much intertwined and uh, quite explicit as, and visible uh, on the streets. So the demands that you see at this point, um, which is sort of a continuation of what we have seen in particular ever since, uh, what we call sort of the protest movement that, that started in November 2019 uh, uh, and even before that in 2017 and 18, um, more and more and more and more explicit are anti um, uh, the government. Uh, and so this is, I think, important to highlight because uh, it's important to highlight the need to address uh, the situation, um, uh, the, the, the rights violations, both holistically, but also um, um, specifically. Uh, and this is, I think, by now a direct uh, request of, of Iranians on the street from the world, from the international community. Um, and so um, with that, I would uh, also like to point out uh, one last point before I, I conclude, and that is um, uh, the unity that we see among the protesters. Um, and um, this is also very important because uh, we see uh, different kinds of marginalized groups, um, you know, women, men, and also generationally, uh, we see um, a, a sense of collaboration on the street and also um, in the activism uh, movements. And um, uh, what that means uh, is that probably the level of repression in the months to come will only increase because, uh, you know, many of us in the community believe that this sense of unity is one of the one of Tehran's biggest fears because they have managed to sort of, you know, use the divide and rule uh, uh, approach for many years. So, um, again, with the with the perspective of further repressions, deepened repressions, um, I think this is important because they will do. Um, we predict that they will do everything and anything in their power in order to. Um, 
in, a, in order to make sure that the, this unity doesn't reach another level. Um, we in the civil society, we are calling for the international community to really advance uh, their action uh, that lead to increased accountability for rights violations perpetuated, especially around uh, protests since 2019. Um, and we think that the UN should mandate a group of relevant special procedures to investigate allegations and produce a standalone report that document and identify those who are um, uh, culpable. Um, the, with that in mind, I just want to again highlight the crisis of the lack of rule of law and a crisis of accountability and uh, in a way, an absolute culture of impunity. I mean, we see that the people who were, uh, you know, repressing uh, protesters on the street in 2019 are the same people again today that um, are the same authorities. We even hear from them. This has become part of their biography as, uh, as, in, as individuals who have become well-trained to repress people on the street and, um, and to use uh, uh, force against them. And, um, and, and another example of it is uh, the president of the country, Ibrahim Raisi, who has a history of involvement in major crackdowns in the country in the past. So uh, our call is uh, an end to the, to the lack of accountability and the culture of impunity, or else we worry that um, it will be a signal for Tehran to continue these repressions, especially as we also believe that the protest movement will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Azadeh. I know that everyone in civil society is really echoing your calls to an end to this impunity. Um, I now give the floor to Suzanne Tamasby, founder and executive director of Femena. Suzanne, I know your organization Femena is working tirelessly to preserve and expand civic space for women, not just in Iran, but also across the region. Um, we are eager to hear what you've been observing over the past 19 days and what strikes you about this moment in time in particular. Uh, thank you very much, Skylar, and thank you um, for Impact Iran and everyone else who helped organize this event that's been co-sponsored by an array of groups, including ours, Femina, and I'm very pleased to be here with a group of very distinguished panelists, including two special rapporteurs. We're very happy that you're paying attention, close attention to what's happening in Iran. Um, I want to echo some of what Ozada said, that, you know, this is a, a protest as part of an ongoing protests, ongoing series of protests that have been happening in Iran, certainly for the last, you know, five, six years, but but even longer than that, really since 2009, that there we've, we've consistently had protests, but these mass protests, 2017, 2019, and, and now this one. And um, while the demands of the protesters now are very much about political change and political accountability and democracy and really targeting the whole system, um, I want to point out that these protests, this particular protest is unique in the sense that it started out at very minimally started out and still continues to be focused in large part on the demands for women's rights and accountability for the death and custody of Mahsa Amini. Uh, Gina Mahsa Amini, a Kurdish Iranian woman who was so brutally murdered um, uh, while in custody of police and the police have refused to be accountable in any way. Um, and so in that sense, this is a very unique protest because while women's groups have held protests demanding rights and to, dis and to discrimination for many years, we've never been able to, they've never been able to garner national support in this way. Um, and to get people from such different social economic backgrounds in different cities, small and big, across the country involved, making demands on behalf of women, but then on, be on behalf of themselves for other political um, issues and, and really looking, seeking to end the political unrest, I mean, the political dissatisfaction that they have. And I also want to point out to even in Baluchistan, um, where we was the uh, uh, location of a very bloody crackdown um, where um, uh, people who were praying were attacked, were shot down. We've had over 60 people killed in that, in that, you know, massacred really. 
um, one of the main contributing factors to the demonstrations there and the, the discussions that people were having during Friday of prayers was accountability on the rape of a Baluchi girl. So this also fed into it. So I just really want to point out that center, a big part of these protests are about women's issues and women's rights. And it's important to keep that in mind that we cannot have peace nor we can have democracy without having the rights of women met. And it's going to contribute. We can't have political stability. Um, because these protests, and I, I want to also point out that the, the slogan of the protest, which has been picked up the world, the world around, is uh, women, life, freedom, um, really exemplifies the feminist nature and the women-centered nature of these protests. And for this reason, so many women human rights defenders have been targeted. Human rights defenders have been targeted generally. Everyone has been picked up. Even the head of the judiciary mentioned that, that there needs to be preemptive efforts to stop the protests through these arrests. So human rights defenders, lawyers, activists, political activists, human rights activists, uh, uh, journalists, they've all been arrested, but a large number of them also include women human rights defenders, in particular in Kurdistan, where these protests started, initially started, the numbers have been disproportionate. And um, we've seen, um, uh, we have, we've been able to document over 50 women human rights defenders that have been arrested and something like 30 student female student activists that have been arrested, but we know those numbers are much, much higher than what we've been able to document it because it's difficult to document. People are afraid to report. They don't have news of their loved ones or we don't have access to it. So um, before the protest started, we already had something like over 50 women human rights defenders in prison. This is not political prisoners because if we talk about women political prisoners, the numbers are much higher, but over 50 women human rights defenders that we had targeted and this is we had identified and this doesn't include a lot of the women who rights defenders in the provinces who are lesser known um, so this this will go to show that this this um, targeting will also weaken the women's movement that's been under assault for some time now um, so I think it's important for us to continue to pay attention to what's happening to human rights defenders or what's happening to women rights defenders and how this assault is going to continue against the women's movement and women in Iran who are demanding change and now have been able to tie that change somehow to political change as well. Um, the conditions that we're hearing about prison conditions are very uh, poor. Um, they're alarming, they're, um, uh, they're crowded, and there's not, there may, many of the prisons are makeshift prisons, and there's no ventilation, people are dying, we're hearing reports about how people are dying in prison, um, and then also, uh, we're also hearing about sexual violence at the time of arrest of uh, of many of the protesters, uh, individual protesters in uh, not necessarily human rights defenders. We haven't been able to hear that. And I just want to mention a couple of things very quickly. First of all, the women's prison and Evin prison, they've issued a statement and they've also joined a sit-in in support of the demands of the protesters. Um, and lastly, I want to just mention a couple of names before I close. Nidufar Hamadi and Elohim Mohammadi, who were two female journalists who covered the story first and foremost. Nidufar broke the story in Sharq Daily, and then uh, Elohim Mohammadi went to Saqqas when Masa Amini was being buried and reported from there. They've been, ar been arrested. Many of the uh, human rights defenders in Kurdistan, such as Gina Modares Gorji or Mujgan Kawusi, who's a sociologist, has been uh, arrested. Mansur Musavi, who's a uh, uh, as a documentary filmmaker has been arrested, a lawyer, Masa Ghulam Alizadeh, has been arrested. So it's a lot of a lot of women human rights defenders have been arrested. We've documented some of these cases in three reports. We're going to continue to document these cases. It's important to pay attention to who they are. Many of them are not well known. So they, it's important not to let them get lost in the shuffle. And paying attention to these cases is critical to ensure their safety and that they're treated well in prison. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Susan, for this really important perspective. And thank you to Fanana for, for co-hosting this important uh, side event also. Uh, we'll now turn to hear from Amnesty International, who's also co-sponsoring this event. Uh, Amnesty is represented on this panel by Ms. Diana El Tahawi, Deputy Regional Director for Middle East and North Africa. Alongside other organizations, Amnesty has been documenting the events unfolding over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Ms. El Tahawi, can you please tell us what Amnesty has been observing? 
Um, thanks very much, Skylar, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for Impact Iran um, and the other organizers for pulling this very timely event together. Um, I'd like to start Amnesty International's intervention by quoting a protester from Esfahan who has told Amnesty International, please be our voice. We are standing firm in the streets. We are risking our lives on the street. Please, please stand up for us. Uh, the fact that he and thousands and thousands of others um, continue to take to the streets in Iran in the face of bloody repression reveals the extent of outrage in Iran regarding compulsory discriminatory and abusive veiling laws, um, about decades of repression of any form of dissent, and about uh, impunity for deliberate and unlawful killings, not just in the streets like we're seeing now, but also behind prison walls and detention centers, as has been the case for Mahsa Zina Amini. Um, in response to this latest wave of protests triggered by her death, um, the Iranian authorities have resorted to their well-honed machinery of repression, to the tactics that all of us are very familiar with and that um, a number of distinguished panelists have already addressed. At Amnesty International, we have uh, gathered a substantive amount of evidence in the past two weeks, including eyewitness accounts that point to a pattern um, of the systemic use of unlawful lethal force and other force to crack down on these, um, on these protests. Security forces uh, have used firearms. Um, they have uh, used metal pellets and birdshot at close range, um, aiming sometimes at protesters' uh, heads uh, and upper bodies, which shows an intent to cause maximum harm. Uh, they have carried out mass arrests of protesters, bystanders, and activists, and women's rights defenders, as we have just heard. Um, they have brutally beaten protesters in the streets and have sexually assaulted many of them. Uh, consistent with past patterns, they have also disrupted internet um, uh, access in the aim to of hiding their crimes. But at Amnesty International, we have been able to obtain official uh, documents which have been leaked that show that there has been a premeditated systematic plan to crush these protests at any cost. Uh, and here I'm quoting from top commanders ordering armed forces at provincial level to mercilessly confront, uh, severely confront protesters. One of these orders was issued on the 21st of, uh, of September. Uh, and within, uh, within hours, uh, the use of firearms has intensified. And on that day, Amnesty International has been able to record uh, dozens of deaths and injuries from the use of um, live ammunition, as well as from the use of birdshot and other metal pellets. Last Friday, uh, the 30th of September, which is now referred to as Bloody Friday in Iran, uh, the deadliest day on record since this latest wave of protests has uh, begun. Security forces, some of them stationed on rooftops of a police station and uh, adjacent buildings, have opened fire at thousands of protesters and worshippers who had gathered in a prayer area in Zahedan in Sistan and Baluchistan province, and who have um, started to march towards the police station in solidarity with national protests, but also as um, the previous speaker mentioned to protest against the reported rape of a Baluchi girl at the hands of a police commander and uh, lack of accountability for this uh, for this crime. Um, in that incident alone, we Amnesty International has recorded over 40 names of those of those killed. Um, overall, we have recorded 95 deaths, including of uh, of women and children. But we fear and we know that the death toll is, is higher and we are continuing our investigations to identify um, additional victims. Um, in an attempt to absolve themselves of, uh, of responsibility of these deaths, the Iranian authorities have uh, dubbed protesters as rioters, enemies of the state, and have also blamed um, rioters on, on the deaths. On the other hand, they have tried to justify their use of force by pointing to some acts of violence by, by protesters. And while um, Amnesty International has seen reports and some footage of a minority of protesters engaging in, in acts of violence, um, it's important to note that under international law and standards, um, the use of force in response to such violence uh, must meet always uh, and comply always with the principles of proportionality, legality, and necessity. 
And security forces must not, must not use firearms except to defend themselves or others from an imminent um, threat to life or serious injury. And I'd like to emphasize that in none of the incidents documented by Amnesty International where protesters or bystanders have been killed, this has been, this has been the case. In addition to the use of lethal force, Amnesty also documented um, sexual assaults and other forms of gender-based violence uh, against, against protesters by security forces, which include grabbing women's breasts, but also yanking women uh, by their hair to punish them for removing their headscarves in acts of defiance. And because of these well-documented patterns of torture and other ill treatment, we are extremely worried about the safety and well-being of the hundreds of protesters, bystanders, activists, women rights defenders who have been arrested since the beginning of, of protests. Now, it's important to remember that the ongoing bloodshed and crackdown is not taking place in a vacuum. It is taking place amid a systemic, deep-rooted crisis of impunity in Iran, which has seen um, Ibrahim Raisi rise to the presidency despite evidence of his involvement in past and ongoing crimes against humanity linked to the 1988 prison massacres. It's high time for members of um, the international community, all UN member states engaging at the Human Rights Council to support the establishment of an investigative and accountability mechanism for the most serious crimes committed in, in Iran. We believe that such a mechanism would not only deter um, further crimes, but would send a signal to the Iranian authorities that such crimes will not go uninvestigated um, and unpunished. They would, it would also pave um, ways for accountability and justice, as we know that domestic avenues for that are closed. We believe that this mechanism would complement the mandate of the special, special rapporteur um, on the human rights situation in Iran, and given the scale and and gravity of violations, additional resources are needed to confront uh, the ongoing cycles of, uh, of bloodshed and ensure accountability. Um, and we fear that without this kind of decisive action by the international community, um, countless more people in Iran risk being killed, tortured, maimed, uh, thrown behind prison's bars, simply for peacefully protesting and for expressing their legitimate grievances. Um, and I'd also like to close with a plea from a father who lost his 21-year-old son who was um, unlawfully killed by security forces on the 21st of September. He told Amnesty International, please tell people, tell people um, tell the UN that people expect the UN to defend us and the protesters. I too can condemn the Iranian authorities. The whole world can condemn them. But to what end this condemnation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Aldoawe, for that very powerful ending to your remarks. Uh, next, I turn to Mr. Mahmoud Amiri Mokadam, Director of Iran Human Rights. Iran Human Rights has been documenting the situation and reporting on violations committed by Iranian security forces. Mahmoud, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be in the panel with uh, uh, all of you. And I will not uh, repeat uh, many of the things that uh, was mentioned because uh, I fully agree. So um, as, as uh, you see, the protests that were triggered by the brutal murder of uh, Mahsa, Gina, um, Amini, they have grown into nationwide protests uh, where Iranians are calling for their fundamental rights and they clearly say no to the Islamic Republic and to the repression they have had uh, more than 40 years. So as it was mentioned, the Iranian authorities' response is the way it was in 2009, November, shutting down the internet, and shooting at the people. So they have uh, used also this time live ammunition against the, uh, and lethal force against the protesters. According to our reports, uh, we have managed to confirm uh, until yesterday, at least 154 uh, uh, protesters who were killed, including women and uh, children. And um, so, so this is the, uh, the response that maybe we were expecting, but um, there is a certain, 
a, a clear difference between this time and the previous times. The main difference is in the determination of the people. Now, about three weeks after the protests, three weeks after the Iranian authorities started shooting at the people, they are still on the streets and the protests are growing. Their anger, we see clearly, I have not seen so angry people on the streets in many years. But on the other side, we, we know the Iranian authorities very well. We, we know that they are willing to go very far to hold on the power because they know that these protests, if they continue, they have the potential to bring about a bigger change. So Iranian authorities, the Islamic Republic, uh, um, the, the Revolutionary Guards, they have the experience of saving Bashar Assad in 2011 in Syria by killing thousands of people. And what happened in Zahedan, as my colleagues mentioned in Balochistan on Friday, I mean, so far we have gathered and confirmed 63 names, 63 people being killed on the street by direct shooting. The actual number is much higher. We are um, updating it and probably the number will be closer to 90, 90 people, one day, one city. So I think that the actions that the international community uh, must take should be beyond condemnation. We, we need um, some um, specific actions that send a much more clear signal. Of course, some of them are symbolic. I think it's about time that the international community acknowledge and support the Iranian people's demands for fundamental rights. That's an important symbolic act. But, but in addition, establishing mechanisms, I agree with that completely. We had this triple IM mechanism for Syria, where um, you have the international impartial and independent mechanism. And this is something that should be established for the Iranian uh, authorities, uh, both in this protest and also in the previous protests. Um, and uh, just um, adding again, um, you know, to the reactions, I think, you know, Islamic Republic sitting in the UN Commission on the Status of Women, I think it's a huge insult to all the women, not only in Iran, across the world. This might be an, uh, a symbolic act to expel them from there, but I think it's, uh, it sends a very strong message. I think I stop here and then we can uh, continue the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mokaram. Uh, we'll now watch a video message from UN Women delivered by Ms. Adriania Quinones, the Director of UN Women Liaison Office in Geneva. UN Women is the main UN agency working on the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. Last week, UN Women issued a public statement about the situation of women's rights in Iran. The video message will play now. Greetings from UN Women in Geneva. We are grateful for the invitation to be able to share with you UN Women's statement on women's rights in Iran. In recent days, Iran has seen deep public unrest with demonstrations and protests taking place in some 80 cities, triggered by the tragic death of Mahsa Amani, who was detained by authorities in Tehran on 13 September and died while in custody three days later. UN Women stands with the women of Iran in their rightful demands to protest injustice without reprisal and to be free to exercise their bodily autonomy, including their choice of dress, and also supports them in seeking accountability and upholding of their basic human rights as stipulated in the Charter of the United Nations. We call on relevant authorities to support and enable the expression of their full human rights in a safe environment without fear of violence, prosecution, or persecution. We align with the remarks by the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the need to ensure the rights to due process and release of all women who have been arbitrarily detained 
and with the special procedures of the Human Rights Council in the call for the Iranian authorities to hold an independent, impartial and prompt investigation into Ms. Amini's death, to make the findings of the investigation public and to hold all perpetrators accountable. We reiterate our expression of condolences to the family of Mahsa Amani. We remain steadfast in upholding the rights of women and girls in every part of the world. I thank you. Before we turn to the audience for questions and comments, I want to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Katharina Stich, Permanent Representative of Germany to the United Nations in Geneva for some concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And with a view of the time, I will be very brief. Thank you very much, dear panelists, for your clear words and also for um, giving us more insight in the situation on the ground. And I am still very much impressed um, by the powerful voices um, you gave and also by the powerful voices you have made heard today. I think it is clear from this discussion that we are all united in our sorrow. We are deeply concerned and saddened by the violent death of Mahsa Amini. And we are deeply concerned about the human rights situation in Iran especially, but not only, with a view to equal conditions of human rights of women. And we all urge the Iranian authorities to refrain from disproportionate use of force against peaceful protesters. And we call on Iran to respect the human rights of all people. Dear colleagues and dear friends, two days ago, we in Germany celebrated our national day the day of reunification. More than 30 years ago in our country, people were marching on the streets in East Germany, fighting and singing for freedom. And when remembering this, our foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, drew a direct line from those protesters to those fighting in Iran today. And she pointed out that freedom finally came because of the brave men and women in the streets. Dear colleagues and friends, there is a wave of international solidarity with the courageous women and men in the streets in Iran today. And as vice president of the Human Rights Council, I find it very encouraging that already 58 states have called on Iran to stop the violence and to fully grant human rights for men and women. And let me conclude by saying, it is our duty to explore how we can stand by the people of Iran. And Luisa Ansberg has pointed out some of the engagement of my own country. The world must not look away because women's rights are human rights and human rights are not divisible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stish, and thank you again to the Permanent Mission of Germany for co-sponsoring this event. Um, we'll extend the time about 15 minutes for those that want to make interventions or questions. Um, so please use the raise hand button in the bottom of your screen or use the Q&A chat box and we'll call on you that way. Uh, panelists, if you're free to stay on for about 15 minutes, please, uh, please do so. So I'll just see if there are any hands raised and we will go that way. Uh, Shola Zamini. Uh, hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for uh, organizing this very, very important uh, side event. Uh, I, I just wanted to bring up my worries about the people who are in detention. So I uh, suppose that um, uh, Susan spoke about it uh, uh, in her speeches as well. Uh, there are lots of people who has been arrested with lots of injuries, so broken uh, 
legs, broken hands, nose, um, who knows if they have any kind of uh, inside bleedings, uh, and then uh, we are almost sure that not many of them would be uh, treated properly uh, after the arrest as well. So uh, we are really very much concerned about the situation of those who are in um, the jails, overcrowded jails, was um, we don't have a very precise number, of course, but even the, um, the Iranian agencies, for example, IRNA was spoken at, uh, spoke about uh, at 24th of September, about 700 arrests only in Gilan province. So, um, you can imagine uh, none of the uh, uh, prisons in Iran are uh, prepared for so many arrests uh, in at the same time, and uh, we know that all, almost all arrests are uh, done very brutally. So um, I just wanted to bring up this concern as well uh, uh, to everybody which is in this session. I know that everybody already think about this, but uh, we uh, 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 maybe we can uh, somehow put more pressure on the Islamic Republic so that they can avoid uh, the things that happened in Kahrizak during 2009. Thank you very much for the time. Sholay, thank you very much for your really um, insightful comments. I think because we're a little short on time, we'll take if there's any more uh, interventions or questions, those, and then perhaps we'll come back to the panelists for a reaction in, in bulk. Um, so if there are any more hands, please use the raise hand function and then we can come back. Um, Asham Motasani. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please feel free. Uh, very good. Um, well, uh, yeah, there is there is one recommendation that I wanted, uh, that one suggestion that I wanted to raise, uh, considering the irresponsibility and unaccountability of the Islamic Republic regime, uh, there is uh, one action that Amnesty or United Nations or other neutral international organizations can take, and um, this is to consider organizing a neutral and fair online referendum. Uh, this was my suggestion. I, I understand that this referendum might not have any, um, any uh, legal implications inside Iran or any uh, effect on the regime change inside Iran, but at least what it can do is to uh, enlighten us all Iranians as well as international community about uh, the percentage of people who are against the current regime. Uh, the, the, this would be quite helpful um, for, for Iranians to be able to uh, perhaps look for other alternatives uh, to communicate with the world. Um, right, you see, I mean, uh, in, instead of having uh, the Islamic Republic as the representative of, of Iranians, we can then be looking for alternatives uh, who can represent Iranians, maybe among those who are not living inside Iran, but, but who are abroad or anything like that. Uh, that was my suggestion. Uh, thank you very much for listening to that. Thank you, Arsham. Um, next, I give the floor to Lucia Chicote. Ms. Chakote, uh, you have to unmute yourself if you're able. Okay, perhaps we can um, wait just one moment. I think we're having a, a bit of technical difficulty with the muting. And I don't see any other hands. So um, if the panelists want to, uh, or sorry, we'll go to Shadi uh, Shabas for the next intervention. Thank you so much for the floor. 
Um, I just wanted to ask, um, what about the youth dimensions um, in these protests? Because we have seen a lot of reactions from feminist um, international bodies, but the youth bodies uh, within the United Nations and across um, international organizations and neutral mechanisms have been very silent. So this is not a youth issue uh, to them, apparently, even though the average age of the, the deaths and the detentions are very young. And um, the other question that um, we get asked a lot is, okay, if there can be no direct um, intervention within Iran, and if all it can be done is to express concern, condemn and look for um, an investigation mechanisms, what else can realistically be done by the international community so that Iranian people adjust their expectations to that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that intervention. Um, I think we'll hand it back to the panelists now, given our short amount of time. So um, I'll allow you all to take the questions that you feel best um, appropriate and um, please just unmute yourself. Um, thank you. If, if I could just briefly respond. Um, um, well, what we have seen, what started um, as uh, the unfortunate tragic death of the 22-year-old Masa Amini um, ignited uh, some very serious concerns and issues within the Iranian society. Uh, there is endemic violence against women. And, and of course, uh, the law on compulsory hijab is one manifestation of that. There are so many. You talk about um, child marriages, enforced marriages. You talk about uh, cross discrimination against women in all aspects of um, public life, private life, and in family law, even to the extent of criminal laws. You see, when, when you talk about criminal laws, you have kisas and uh, hadood laws where girls and women are discriminated, even to the extent of blood money. So in that kind of environment, um, and it, more broadly, um, it, it isn't just confined to uh, violence against women. There is lack of accountability, there, there is absence of rule of law, absence of democratic governance. People's civil and political rights are, are persistently and aggressively and egregiously violated. People's economic, social, um, cultural, and I must emphasize linguistic rights. I mean, we, we see all of these um, minority provinces, you see, they, they seek justice and fairness. So in all of that, uh, Iran, poses some very serious concerns. And I would urge the international community now to actually seriously consider it, uh, as well as what the international community and other civil society organizations are saying, what effectively can be done. And obviously my role is reporting of these human rights violations and condemning these human rights violations and, and going before the Human Rights Council as well as the General Assembly. But I, I need to be uh, supported in my mandate, including having an access to the country. And I would urge the international community to, to support me in that endeavor so that we can properly hold those individuals who have done these egregious violations of human rights to be fully accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. And are there any other panelists that would like to respond? Yes, Susan, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. So I just want to pick up on a couple of points that were made. First of all, yes, this is besides being a, a very focused on women, it's also very focused on youth as the, the very young uh, age of protesters, but also those imprisoned and those killed. Uh, shows that it's also very much a youth movement, a youth protest, um, and uh, the attacks on the universities, because the universities were one of the first or the, the one of the first groups to announce protests, organize protests, along with women's groups and then Kurdish, Kurdish groups. So it is very much, I think it is very important point that you raised that um, uh, mandate holders and international groups that, that are working specifically on youth and youth safety 
should really take this case up and investigate violations against youth. The conditions of prison I mentioned, and I think Shola also mentioned, they really are problematic. We have this history of prisoners dying in Kahrizak, and we have similar prison conditions that people are reporting. I mentioned Gina Modara Sigurji, who's a Kurdish women's rights activist. She, on the Sunday after she was um, arrested, she called home and said that the conditions under which she's being imprisoned are so bad. She's there with 10 others. We we assume 10 other women who rights defenders, but not sure. But it's a it was a makeshift. It was that she was being held in the youth detention center and um, uh, they had been beaten and tortured and she was going on hunger strike. We don't have any news of her condition since, but we hear a lot about makeshift prisons where there are no ventilation, where people are coming in injured, and also reports that perhaps they're also dying, similar to what happened in um, Kahrizak. So I think this is really important to, to pay attention, pay attention to this. Um, it's important for human rights. We're not a documenting organization. We're, we've taken this up in a crisis situation, but it's important for human rights organizations to really stay abreast and continue to document and, you know, and the UN as well, and to see what happens not only to the human rights defenders, but to ordinary prisoners. Um, because if they're not known, their cases don't get covered and they're much more susceptible to violations of their rights and to, you know, dangerous prison conditions and, and loss of life. And and this has consistently been a grievance on human rights defenders who've said that because, especially if they're in the, the provinces, they're not as well known, their cases do not get taken up. So this is important. And in terms of the UN, I think, you know, I, I, I think UN uh, panelists can speak better to this, but as somebody who worked on the ground, I will say that the UN system does not work with civil society. The, and I know this is the structure of the UN, but it's extremely problematic. I mean, part of the UN, UN is for human rights. It's not for development. We have reduced the mandate of the UN to development so that it doesn't does it annoy the governments who do not care, who, who are who find human rights issues problematic? But human rights is the central focus of the UN system, and UN systems within countries need to push governments, not only appease governments, to only work on particular issues. And in Iran, for a long time, women's issues have been seen as sensitive, and the UN has been prevented from working on it. And if they did work on it, they only worked on it with groups of the government, you know, conservative groups that don't necessarily advocate human rights. So if we're talking about the UN, we really need to. Think, rethink how the UN operates on the ground and really reform that process so that it's adhering to and addressing rights violations and certainly women's rights violations, women's issues that have been on, you know, that have women's women's movement within Iran have, have been talking about this for almost for, for at least for 30 years, if not loudly for 40 years, loudly for 30 years. And the UN has systematically failed to take it up on the ground. So this is a place where we can address it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite any of the panelists to make a closing remarks or respond. Um, we're coming up at the end of our, our time here, but um, please raise your hand if you have any final remarks you'd like to add. Uh, Diana, please. Um, thank you very much. Now, I'll try to be brief uh, this time, just picking up on um, a number of points raised by um, our audience on the on the issue of uh, torture and other ill treatment in in prisons and other detention facilities this is a concern that we very much share um, and amnesty international has documented the systemic use of torture and forced disappearances unfair trials in the context of the mass arrest that took place in november 2019 so we fear that similar patterns are going to be reproduced unless there's concerted international action we also know from our campaigning work um, that when uh, there is attention on particular individual cases um, of those who are arbitrarily detained, particularly as Suzanne was saying, those cases that are less known globally, their deten at the very least, um, their detention conditions improve. And sometimes we also see um, other impact, including releases on furlough, et cetera. So it is, it is extremely important to continue to work um, on the situation of those arbitrarily detained. Um, on, uh, on what um, international organizations can do in addition to, um, to, to monitoring and reporting and trying to give a platform um, to those whose voices are being repressed in, in Iran um, is, uh, uh, is, is trying to garner international support 
uh, for accountability mechanisms, paving ways for accountability, which is not possible domestically. Um, for, from our perspective, from Amnesty International, we've launched a global uh, petition calling on our members and, and supporters, and this petition has been taken up by our, our national entities across the world, to call on all member states that are engaging um, with the Human Rights Council to establish this investigative and accountability mechanism as, um, as a signal to the Iranian authorities that business as usual cannot uh, continue. Um, and this petition has already garnered tens of thousands of, of signatures across, uh, across the globe. And we'll continue to do that and we'll continue to call um, on the international community to go beyond condemnation in their response to the current crisis in Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Azadeh, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I just uh, would like to um, uh, emphasize on, on what um, Susan and Diana said and um, uh, to say that those of us also, um, you know, in contact with the country to the extent possible hear frustration from the people when it comes to, um, uh, you know, actions that stay at condemnation and not beyond. And um, to also echo um, our collective call at Impact Iran and the bigger community that we are in touch with for an investigative, independent investigative mechanism um, that uh, the Human Rights Council can um, form in order to uh, really look into these atrocities. And in, in our view, this would uh, um, complement the importance and uh, uh, the effective work that uh, Dr. Rahman, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights, um, human rights is doing. But, and also it will um, not only serve as an investigative mechanism, but in the end, it will also have a preventative um, impact. Um, because for as long as the authorities don't see um, that, um, you know, that, that there is a price um, uh, attached to their atrocities, um, it, this will go on and um, yet another generation will be their victims. So I just wanted to reiterate that call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azadeh. And Mahmoud, did you want to speak or uh, I saw your hand up? Um, yes, I, I'll be very short. I just, um, uh, you know, on what Azadeh just uh, said and also the others about establishment of uh, an independent impartial investigation mechanism. Um, so we have had this mechanism for other countries, for Syria, for uh, I think Myanmar, it's slightly different. So it is possible for United Nations to go beyond uh, resolutions and statements, but of course, it, uh, as um, Susan also said, it's a, uh, United Nations uh, is actually uh, based on the voices of the governments. And uh, so it means that people who are listening to us, you know, they can in their own respective countries, if they are outside Iran, they can work with their governments uh, and ask them to support such a mechanism. Um, but it is possible because I know that, you know, I've, I hear it very often, people say, what else can you do without, uh, except resolutions? And, uh, and of course, I, resolutions are important. The Iranian authorities do whatever they can to avoid them, to avoid getting attention. But uh, I think uh, it's important to work with your respective countries and ask them to support this mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, I, I think I close the discussion. I, I would like to thank the permanent mission of Germany of, to impact Iran, uh, to FEMINA, to Amnesty International, and to our other co-sponsors, as well as our distinguished panelists. Um, this was a really insightful discussion. I trust we could all stay here the remainder of the day to discuss it, but it seems we have a lot of work to do. So um, with that, I thank the audience as well for the active engagement and attendance, and I wish you all a very good rest of your day and evening. Thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Skylar. Bye.